All right, Annetta, uh, lock the doors, because uh, what I'm about to say is going to upset some people right next here. Uh, okay. Christopher Columbus did not discover America. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, never mind the question of like, uh, like how you can discover a place where the inhabitants are watching you arrive from the shore. Uh, yeah, they, weren't, they weren't wearing pants. Is that what somebody said? I like that. Uh, so anyway, there were, there were actually many other mariners before Columbus that discovered America as well. Decades earlier, even eons earlier, uh, there were so many people that were coming across uh, these islands and this continent. But it's only been in the last century that evidence has surfaced and continually grown to indicate that many of these pre-Columbian explorers might have come from Africa. So the first scientist to promote this possibility was Leo Wiener. Born in Russia, Wiener immigrated uh, to the United States in the late 19th century on his way to British Honduras, uh, where he planned to open a vegetarian commune. Well, uh, when that turned out not to be the dream job he expected, uh, he uh, moved back to the United States and he became a professor at Harvard University, as one does. And, uh, but in his time in Mesoamerica, he started noticing things. There were lots of things that led him to encounter certain discoveries that uh, made him consider that possibly uh, if the origins of American civilization might actually be in Africa. So he observed so many linguistic and botanical and other similarities that between 1920 and 1922, he published an extensive three-volume piece uh, called Africa and the Discovery of America. Now, unfortunately, this is the 1920s, so as yet, no serious archaeological evidence had been done to, or work had been done to support his botanical theories, because everyone knows over raiding tombs in, uh, in Egypt and things like that. Nod to Howard Carter. So, he didn't have a whole lot of other stuff than, uh, than the names to support him. However, he knew that other clues must exist. For example, he pointed out that Columbus himself was aware that African mariners had preceded him. In his diary of his second voyage, uh, Columbus tells of how the natives of Hispaniola actually had given him gold-tipped metal spearheads that they said were brought by black-skinned people who had come in large boats from the south and southeast. Hmm. Coincidence? I think not. No. So uh, what's interesting about that, so upon returning to Spain is that he actually took the spearheads and he, uh, he sent them away and they had them uh, assayed and it turned out to be that they, uh, uh, the, these spearheads were covered in this metal, that, uh, this alloy that the inhabitants called guanin and uh, <coughs> the metallurgists uh, actually found out that this was an alloy of 32 parts. It was like 18 of gold, six of silver, eight of copper, which dun 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 match the metal used in spearheads made in Western Africa for thousands of years as carried by medieval African warriors, including the Mali and the Moors. The West Africans even called this metal guanine, the same name used by the natives of Hispaniola. But nothing more was said about that. Conspiracy. Well, probably because, you know, the, in the interest of Spain, uh, it, was, it was in their best interest that they didn't want to have any challenges to their discovery and the claims of the islands of the West Indies. Well, as the poem goes, or it should anyway, in 1493, Columbus stole all he could see. Yeah, so on his second voyage, which was 10 times larger than the first, uh, Columbus went on a frantic but unsuccessful island hopping trip to find gold and spices. He carried along several natives uh, from his newly discovered San Salvador, uh, which the inhabitants called uh, Guanahanvi. Uh, another island that the natives pointed out, which was really large, and uh, was called uh, Soameto. Soameto. Now, Columbus continued going around whimsically renaming every island he could find. But, uh, you know, Leo Wiener, being the, uh, being the curious person and the linguist that he was and the etymologist, he, he couldn't help noticing that the origin of these many place names and botanical names in Mesoamerica uh, actually sounded distinctly like other languages in Africa, particularly Bantu and even Arabic. 
Wiener and numerous other botanists have also puzzled over the presence of certain plants that predated Columbus but originated in Africa. For example, the calabash bottle gourds. <coughs> now, this is a species originally from West Africa where they were well cultivated in America before Europeans arrived, now, even long before they existed in Indonesia or Polynesia. So, in fact, the Pacific was the last place that bottle gourds actually reached and expanded to. Part of, my, part of my coffee. <clears throat> well, if it were not for transatlantic trade pre-Columbian times, it would be very difficult to, exp <coughs> to explain how certain plants, such as the yam, the sweet potato, domesticated cotton, peanuts, and tobacco, reached both West Africa and the Americas. The spread of the plantain is particularly noteworthy because it could not remain viable if it was carried in salt water. Well, in the 1640s, a Brazilian botanist named George Margrave. <coughs> thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, speaking, speaking of botany, Ricola. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So thank you very much. So the, so the Brazilian botanist George Marcrave wrote that the establishment of a particular varieties of plantains in this region stands as a strong argument for ancient maritime contact between the Americas and Africa. That's bananas. <laughs> B, B, A, B, A, B, A, N, A, S. <coughs> That's right, thank you. <coughs> All right. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> how do these plants and languages? <coughs> That's going to be good for the video. <coughs> All right. Fix and pose. <laughs> All right, use the cough up. Okay, so how do these plants and languages and other cultural elements get to the Americas? Well, you know, some believe. So what's that? You're well, cheating. you're cheating. Well, you know, some people believe that, <coughs> you know, over, over thousands of years, Africans migrated out of Africa and then over the Bering Strait, then down into South America, and, uh, and things like that. Well, uh, another explanation exists, and so get ready. There you go, let it out of your system. Awesome. Africans had ships. In fact, they had four kinds of, they had, oh, unbelievable. They had, they had a shipload of vessels. And they had, they had, away. The uh, anchors, anchors away, anchors away. So in fact, they had four kinds of vessels. Uh, and Nubian pottery, uh, this is an example of a uh, Nubian pottery with a painting on it that shows a long hold pottery, art. That, uh, that shows either a long-hold boat or a papyrus raft or a, a, a hauled-out canoe. And then this other uh, painting beside it is from, uh, the first one was um, from 3000 BC, and this is a bird's-eye view of an oared riverboat <coughs> in Chad. Uh, and it dates from 3500 BCE. Now, the Africans of Guinea also had dugout canoes hewn from these monumental trees on the coast there. In 1500, 1500, it's just a few years after Columbus's voyage, the Portuguese captain uh, Pacheco Pereira wrote, in this country can be found the largest canoes made of a single trunk. Some are so large that they hold 80 men. Now, the West Africans were known to lash two dugout canoes together, side by side, and no one questions the seaworthiness of a similar type of Polynesian catamarans. Well, here's a 15th century Portuguese painting of sailing canoes on the Congo estuary. The Portuguese, like Captain Pereira, had heard that African traders were visiting Brazil in the mid-1400s. So to demonstrate that mariners from West Africa could have sailed to the Americas using papyrus vessels as early as 2000 BCE, and Norwegian uh, adventurer Tor Heyerdahl actually used ancient shipbuilding techniques in order to construct and sail the Ra 1 and the Ra 2 in 1969 and 70. And generally, some type of sailing vessel um, will average about 100 miles per day, even without sails. And in an ocean current, uh, something like a raft or a reed boat can, uh, 
can average about 60 miles a day. Now, Islamic historian Amir Hajib reported that voyages west from Mali were happening in the year 1311, just uh, 150 years before Columbus. Now, when he asked the Mali emperor, um, shown here, incidentally, holding a, holding a globe of the world made of solid gold, uh, asked him, well, tell me about this uh, rumor about Atlantic travel. And he said that his predecessor had commissioned an expedition with 200 ships filled with men and a similar number with gold and, uh, and water and enough provisions for two years. And he said, uh, uh, you know, come, go, go, and go out and find something. And if you uh, don't come back, so you find something or you run out of food. And uh, unfortunately, only one ship returned uh, and the captains told the emperor that uh, we sailed for a very long time and we'll, until we met what, what, what seemed like a river with a strong current flowing in the open sea. It was, I was the last ship and I turned where I was and did not enter the current. The others disappeared. I do not know what became of them. So, well, this story seems to describe the trade wind driven equatorial current or the canary current. Now, uh, I apologize if anyone has any cats on their lap at the moment. But um, <laughs> so we we basically have a, have two two rivers two circles r circular rivers in the ocean here and it's you can see it's very easy for uh, for Africans from the south and the Angola region and the Angola regions to come up towards the equator and going west westwards or from the western coast of Africa north of the equator to go eastwards along that same current. Uh, so, but you know the the Mercator this Mercator projection doesn't really uh, uh, in terms of cartography. Boo Mercator, um, <laughs> the uh, it, it, so uh, it, it it really doesn't do it justice. So um, let me just uh, uh, I did this little animation for you to uh, to show that they could have taken the Canary Current up and around and then oh they go over the they fall off the edge of the Earth and then they come back and they and they uh, they make landfall back again in. Uh, in um, Cape Verde. So it is definitely possible. So um, I definitely had to do that. Now, at least a dozen explorers, including Constantine Ravenous, reported seeing blacks upon reaching the New World. In fact, in 1513, Spanish explorer Vasco Nunez de Balboa, uh, who you might know because people named a very popular dance after him, uh, the, uh, uh, anyway, so, when Balboa was there, he said he met members of a tribe of Ethiopians in Panama. And according to Balboa's log, these men came from a totally black village that was two days' journey away. And he figured that these blacks had come from Ethiopia uh, at a much earlier date. So there are also examples of physical evidence, including pre-Columbian African skeletons, which have been found throughout the Americas. Now, dating between 800 BCE and 300 CE, these murals are from the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza. Now, they clearly feature, uh, the color version is easier to see, but they clearly feature three races. And uh, there are, it's depicting black and Indian allies and a battle against white invaders. Now, because of their long blonde hair, hair jewelry, the, a skin hold boat that we have here, uh, right there, and also the fact that they're fighting naked, which was common for warriors from Ireland, they believe that these are Celtic warriors. And because this mural shows that blacks are clearly fighting on the side of the Mayans, that they must have been integrated in society much longer before this, uh, this uh, painting was, was done in order to form that form of alliance. Now, there are numerous pre-Columbian figurines with striking similarities to ancient African artwork and they've been found in Central and South America. In southeastern Mexico, there are 18 rock statues that, of heads up to 11 feet tall that are facing the ocean looking east. Now, archaeologists call them the Olmec colossal heads after the people that carved them, and uh, they were produced for 50 to 200 years and date from at least 900 BCE when they were mysteriously buried for some reason. So it should, now think about it. It took enormous effort to quarry these. Uh, the smallest one was six tons, so six to 50 ton blocks, to quarry them and carry them 75 miles away from the quarry and then carve them and then erect them. Uh, these people that they, that they modeled them after must have been important. Whoever they were, they must have been uh, important to be re remembered or obeyed or worshiped. Uh, well, Jose Meglier Serrano, the, uh, the archaeologist who first uncovered them, 
uh, he, said, he pointed out that facial features look amazingly like African blacks, and they all display distinctive headgear or protective helmets. Now, however, some people think that these are actually uh, the facial figures of overweight babies. Yeah, I think, I think they needed to wear helmets when they were babies, if they think that, so. Yeah. And then still others find it easier to believe that instead of Africans, those depicted are responsible for these sculptures, and as well as the Mesoamerican pyramids, uh, were not African Americans, but dun dun dun. So why is it that so many people have never heard of this alternative of American discovery by the continent's nearest neighbors? So, I mean, look, now the thing, exactly, whoa, where would all the continents go? So, uh, this is, um, look at how close this is. I mean, you can, I, I, why people don't think that you could go this is closer compared to more than twice the distance that Columbus sailed. Uh, here's, this will win a drink for you at a, in a bar game sometime. Which, uh, which state is closest to Africa? Maine. Yeah, look, see there, you got to need a globe for this. Look at that. You know, versus, uh, is it, so, uh, yeah, geometry. <laughs> Science. There you go. That's, so anyway, so, and, and so very few Americans know this, and why is this? So having examined, uh, having examined textbooks throughout, uh, for years, up until 2018, James W. Lowen says that although some books cite the alternative possibility that Vikings, Norse, or even Irish may have reached America first, not one textbook, old or new, mentions the West Africans. So whether or not you give any credence to this admittedly controversial Afrocentric theory, uh, it's obvious that Columbus was not the first to discover America, but the last. So why did he make such an indelible mark on Western people's minds? Well, conquest may have a lot to do with it, Right, Eurocentrism, unlike, and, and also unlike the mundanity of perhaps thousands of years of peaceful African transatlantic trade, the quest for gold and world domination makes a much better story. And uh, you know, had, the good Queen Isabella was so proud of her fella that uh, she immediately equipped Columbus with 17 ships, 1,500 men, 200 cannons, crossbows, cavalry, and even 20 attack dogs for a second voyage and another, and another. The story of Columbus remains the most widely accepted version of American discovery, most likely because it was the most recent, the most well-armed, the most documented, and the most similar in appearance to the authors of American textbooks. And, uh, and one other thing that, that should be pointed out here is that uh, in the years after Columbus discovered discovered America. In 400 years, 20 million Africans were stripped from the coast of Africa, half of them dying in transit for slavery, who knows how many fleeing inland. And at the same time, within five years of Columbus's arrival in the New World, 90% of the indigenous population had died from disease or murder, 90%. So the fact is, that leaves few people to have a written or a memory or an oral history of the seafaring of their African discoverers. Historian Samuel D. Marble wrote, as a subject for research, the possibility of African discovery of America has never been a tempting one for American historians. We choose our own history, or more accurately, we select those vistas of history that more or less uh, kind of explain to have the promise of the greatest satisfaction for ourselves. And we have had little appetite to explore the possibility that our founding father was a black man. So nevertheless, there is considerable evidence that to suggest that African mariners also participated in this great adventure, no less than Vikings, the Portuguese, Spaniards, Celts, Chinese, Polynesians and Arabs and others. So now I would like to raise a toast 
to all the discoverers of America before Columbus, wherever you may came from. May more of us discover you. Thank you.